Hello Rosie. I said I'd let you know where I'm sitting so you can... Oh right. Yeah. Oh okay. Give me what have I got to do? What do you want me to do? My ignores the sound people. Oh yes, that's right. Yes, I've got that. Don't worry. I've got, I've got a few of those. If anybody else needs one. I'd almost forgotten that, Tess. I don't think anybody else did. Good. We're all set to go then. Ladies and gentlemen, is that working? Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Probably not. Right! Goodness me, you noisy lot. Um, can you... is this on? I can't hear it. Ah, it's because I put it on mute. How clever of me. Not. Is that better? Is that still, still a bit quiet? No, 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 that's not moved. Ah, I haven't turned it on. Hang on. It's too much technology. You have to forgive me. At the beginning of these lectures, sometimes people try to attract my attention, try to talk to me. It's a really bad idea. Cause I'm, just, I'm always so over... Oh, there you go. I'm always so overwhelmed with technology and trying to get everything together that I, I behave like a bit of a headless chicken or more, more like a headless chicken than usual. Um, anyway, but here we all are. And... We're going to have um, an hour on uh, talking about development, and then there's something else that we have to do, and I can't remember what it is. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so then we'll have a little, 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 little um, assessment test. Okay. Um, very important that you sign this document that goes around so that I know who's not here. It's particularly important today because we're going to have to do a small little assessment. Okay, so it's. Uh, it's coming round now. Please do sign your name. You've got half the time you normally would have to get hold of the register and sign it. Um, so if it stops moving and you know, and you guys that don't see it, just wave and say, "Where's the register?" Okay, and I'll try and find it and get it over. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about development today. I think it's important not to get too caught up on this. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. It's, it's ridiculous to even try to do that in one hour. I've noticed that there's more detail than you really need on some of these slides, but it's there if you want to go and learn more. Um, but this is going to be a very, very rapid um, tour of the beginnings of life and the beginnings of the brain. 
Okay, uh, really recommend this book by Mark Johnson. Um, latest edition, I think, is 2011. Uh, it, it's really helpful way of thinking about learning disorders. So if you're interested in learning disorders, I think this book is particularly helpful. Um, but it's also helpful to anybody who's interested in the first uh, weeks, months, years of human life and how the brain develops. Uh, there is a couple of teaching and learning points. As you know, I'm challenging myself to use a couple of strategies that are developed from what we're beginning to understand about the human brain. Use a couple of strategies in my lectures. Uh, today, you may wish to ask yourself, why am I going to be making the attempts to relax you before the test. Why would I bother to do that? Um, and it, we're also going to be discussing our anxieties before the test, which is an odd thing to do. Perhaps I don't know. Why would I be doing that? Okay, so on to development. This is the reduced version, and it, it's it's a bit of a shock. I always I always find there's a little bit of a shock when I have to introduce the fundamental approach of science to human behavior. And it was only a, it was only about two or three years ago that I noticed that actually this, isn't, this was never being explicitly said on the course. And actually you often don't see it explicitly written anywhere, but this is the basic dogma, if you like, about how humans behave. So when you look in the science, when you look in the psychology, when you look in the neuroscience, there's some basic assumptions being made about what a human being is and what is causing them to behave in a certain way. And of course, what we're particularly interested in is how they, how they learn. Um, but the, the essential dogma is that development is the interaction of genes and the environment. Um, so you, sitting there now, are a product completely of your genotype, the genes, okay, your genetic background, and your environmental history, all the different experiences that have happened to you. There's nothing else. Okay? Nothing else. We don't include anything else in that equation. We'll come, I'll ask you in a minute whether you think there is anything missing from this. <coughs> so that's you, okay, completely summed up with two factors, your genes and your environmental history, your experiences. And then I'm interested as an educator, perhaps, or as, or as a scientist as well, in how you're going to behave during this lecture. So I will then predict how you're going to behave, again, in terms of two factors. One is who you are, and you are just your genes and your experiences to date. That's your phenotype and the present context that you find yourself in. And if we knew everything about those factors, your genes, your history, and where you are now, three things, then I would be able to completely predict what you're going to do, okay, and how much you're going to learn, and whether you're going to write a letter to your boyfriend or girlfriend instead of paying attention, and all sorts of other things. I would know exactly what you're going to do. So in theory, every action taken could be explained in that way. I say that actually because I know you don't sit there writing letters, but I used to, many, many years ago, I used to teach um, primary school teachers Okay, and they were undergraduates, and I did regularly used to have to walk up the aisle to find out who was actually writing letters at the back instead of paying attention. But I know you guys don't do that. I know that. Um, but anyway, in theory, back to the plot, every action taken could be explained in that way. So actions are just interaction between the genes, the environmental history, and where you find yourself now. Has anybody got a problem with that? Does anybody think we left something out? Yes, sir. What do you think we might have left out? It is, um, I have found, I would know about other people, but every moment I think about um, the genes, and of course now we're talking about the mind, how it's organized, I think that naturally, even an eye, just out of the region from an amoeba, from a cell, then decided that it needed to see. Then it involves itself and forms the wall, forms the retina, and connects to the neuron all by itself. Uh, just because of the fact that it needs to see, evolving by nature, I find it extremely 
hard to get to terms with that. Yeah, do you find it sort of limiting? So there's this idea that it's just not enough somehow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of share, share that to some so extent, yeah. But the question is, I guess, because I also feel that sometimes, but, but, but the question is, what could we put in? You know, what could we possibly have left out of this equation, sir? Uh, I think your interpretation of your mental history, so how you interpret what you do from a past to you, so you can somehow, um, as a person, uh, change. As a person change, that's a very interesting phrase that's been used there. So as a person change, so one of the issues that's being, and you're touching upon there, is the idea of free will. Okay, because actually, according to this, you have no responsibility or free will whatsoever. Because everything is predicted. And, and, and actually, that's, a, that's kind of a, a, a problem for us as educators, because we do like to believe in the, in the autonomous learner. So how can we believe that we are producing independent learners if the scientists are telling us that everything is determined in this way? You could say, well, you know, mo motivation and those sorts of issues, those are very important. But then the scientists would say, ah, yeah, but motivation is created by the interaction of your genes and your environment and where you happen to find yourself now. And, of course, this harks back to um, the, the lecture that you had last week uh, where Richard was talking about consciousness and the difficulties that neuroscience has with this idea of free will. And it's kind of convenient to, to think that we don't have free will because actually we don't quite know how we would fit it into this basic dogma. And this is, this is, this is the scientific approach, I guess. So all the papers that you read on this course are, are going to pretty much essentially assume this. And yet it leaves out some of these very basic things which we feel are important to us, such as free will. Of course, the other thing is God. And a lot of you here are, are religious and you believe in God. Where does God exist here? Doesn't. We leave, we leave God out, him or her. Okay? So there are some things which, which hu as, as humans we believe are really, really important, but we can't actually fit them into this. We don't know how to do it as yet. Anyway, so I'm going to leave those other things aside, though, because actually this is the model. <laughs> this is what we have to use. So this is really important to, to understand um, how we develop. And, and of course, there may be things that you might feel are left out of this, but this is the essential approach. Um, and we can go back in time and we see this starting off very, um, very early on at day one. This is the beginning of life. We have a fertilized cell, and I'm just going to take you through some of the changes. And part of this is to give you some impression, some understanding of how the brain develops from the very first moment that the, the cell is fertilized. What are the changes that bring about this in incredible uh, thing that we believe is the brain? And it is an interaction in scientific sense. We believe that it's an interaction between genes and the environment. Of course, a lot of this in the environment is actually the internal environment is the womb. Um, but later on, we'll be talking about environment in terms of what's happening on the, in the external world. So here we have a fertilized egg. And one of the first things that happens day two, we get a lot of additional um, cells uh, being produced through cleavage. Um, and then these cells are beginning to, to compact together. And we have a differentiation into two different cell types. We've got inner and outer cells. And you can see here that there's a sort of a cavity forming um, quite quickly on day five. And the next thing that happens is, you know, this, this egg is now actually quite large. It's got a lot of cells inside. I'm not sure if you still call it an egg, really. But, um, and it then implants itself into the uterus. And the next thing that happens is that we get this... Um, differentiation into further cell types where we have at least three different types of cell and we've got this outside e external um, part here and then we've got two different types of cells here and we have a cavity and they then organize themselves into this shape now remember this is a cross section it's a cross section of something which is kind of spherical and what, the bit that we're really interested in is where these two different types of cell 
actually are touching each other here. Because if you think of this as, as these are basically spheres within spheres, this contact here is, is a disc, isn't it? So you've got two spheres of different types of cell in contact, and they're making a sort of a disc shape. And that's the bilaminar disc. It's bilaminar because it's only made out of two different cells at the moment. But pretty soon, um, we see a different type of cell forming um, and a third layer forming called the mesoderm, the middle layer. And now we have three different types of um, cell. We have three, a three-layered um, disc, essentially, where we've got the ectoderm on top, the mesoderm in the middle, and the endoderm on the bottom. And something is happening here to form a sort of a line in that disc, which we call a primitive streak. Between the top and the bottom layer, the mesoderm forms, whose cells create the notochord. We'll have a look at this in more detail, but essentially there's, there's gonna be a, a little piece of, a little segment of a cord forming here called the notochord, which is quite important because of the proteins that it produces. Um, and on the ectoderm layer, that's, that's at the top here, we also have the primitive streak forming um, and something called the neural plate. Okay, so this is my diagrammatic form um, of these structures. And uh, you can see we've got the three layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. We've got the notochord forming here. And this is producing uh, proteins that drive neurulation and the production of the neural plate here. And this ectoderm is going to actually begin to form the outer layer of the embryo and produce something called the, the neural tube out of this neural plate. And the neural tube is kind of like a factory for neurons and also glial cells as well, which are those structural cells that we talked about. And at this stage, we can, we can already see that there are three different types of uh, three different parts to this uh, disc and these three different parts are going to form very broad categories of different parts of the human body or animal body because actually you know at this stage it's quite difficult to, to tell the difference between a, um, uh, between between what this would look like if it was a chick like a hen or if it was a human um, the nectoderm is going to form um, the brain and the, the skin and the, the um, yeah, via the neural tube, and the middle part, this mesoderm, is going to become the muscle and the bone and the connective fish, uh, tissue, the, the skeleton. Um, and then the in, endoderm right at the bottom is going to form the internal organs of whatever creature this turns out to be. And then we have this very weird thing happen uh, called embryonic folding, which is quite difficult to look at in two dimensions. But Essentially, uh, this all turns inside out. And you can see here it's turning inside out. And the reason why it's turning inside out is because it wants to form something called uh, the neural tube here. So this is the ectoderm. This is the neural plate that was on top of the ectoderm that we saw previously. Let me just take you back to that. This thing here, the neural plate. Oh, sorry, I was going to join this thing, wasn't I? Oh, I forgot this. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right, the neural plate here. This is going to sort of fold, caused by production of, neuro, of proteins here. This is going to do some folding, some very interesting folding now. Um, and what happens is that it folds like this and produces this tube underneath, underneath itself. And this is like a sort of a, a factory, if you like, producing neuroblasts, which themselves produce neurons. Um, and... The neural tube becomes the central nervous systems, system, uh, whereas the neural crest, which is this part, which is on the edges, which sort of gets left between the neural tube and the ectoderm here, that's going to form the peripheral ne nervous system. And this is all happening within sort of 23 days of conception. So the neural tube generates neuroblasts and glioblasts, cells that produce neurons and glial cells. And we're interested in neurons mostly because those are the information processing cells. But actually glial cells also, we now know, get involved with that information processing. But the classic um, role of glial cells is, is structural. So actually guiding the neurons as they're moving and forming the structure of the brain. 
And one end of that neural tube becomes a series of repeated units. Bit, 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 bit. And it becomes, becomes more and more similar to a spinal cord and becomes recognizable as a spinal cord. The other end becomes all bulgy and it forms the forebrain, the hindbrain, and the midbrain. And, the, and you begin to see this quite early on, around sort of 30 days or so. And this is the sort of bulgy thing that you might see here. You see the spinal cord coming down there. Actually, this is a, a chick embryo here. You can see it a bit more clearly um, that, that one end has become all, um, all these little, um, well, you can see it's forming into a spinal cord, becomes sort of segregated. And then the other end is forming into these bulges. And this big bulge right at the end is, becomes the, the forebrain. Um, but even at this stage, you can refer to it as the telencephalon and the diencephalon. And actually, this is, this is really where those words come from. We came across those words when we were talking about neuroanatomy. But I said the forebrain can be referred to as part of the telencephalon. Um, and you, you, quite often when these are being used, they're actually talking about it in terms of the developing brain. And this bulge becomes the midbrain. That's so this is going to become your cortex. This is going to become your reward system or some very important parts of your reward system, such as uh, the ventral tegmental area. Um, and this is going to become, amongst other things, your cerebellum right at the back of the brain here. So you can see right early on and, you know, in all vertebrates, there is this tripartite structure, this three, um, three part structure of forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain. So this is a useful sort of um, categorization that I found here. This is just to remind you really what I was saying. The ectoderm becomes the neural plate, which folds and becomes the neural tube. And then that um, differentiates into prosencephalon, mesencephalon, rhombencephalon, and that sort of becomes recognizable as a midbrain, hindbrain, and forebrain. Now, big question is, the neural tube is producing all of these lovely neurons, but actually, they're all going to different places, aren't they? Um, there are different types of neurons needed in this one place, like in the thalamus, and, and other types of neurons that are going to be needed in the hippocampus, because they do slightly different things. An interesting question is how they find their way there. But, um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the possible clues is that these glial cells actually help guide them uh, as on, on route. The bulges in the tube grow larger, um, and they, they, these neurons are moving and changing in three different ways. They're proliferating, they're being produced, they're migrating, they're traveling, and they're also differentiating into different types as they, as they go. And there's two different ways in which they can move. They can either get behind the old ones and push them forward, or they can actually overtake the old ones. Um, so there's at least two different ways in which they can travel. And that actually, the way in which they travel depends on where they're going. So, for example, the ones that tend to displace the, the, um, the older ones by pushing them away, passive cell displacement, they tend to be heading for the thalamus. Whereas um, the laminate structure is, is more about um, the other type of movement where they're actually going overtaking. So, you know, this, it all seems um, to some extent pre-programmed, if you like. You're getting this impression that things are, are quite pre-programmed. And, and there is a sense in which the genes, which are driving a, m most of this process, is responsible um, for, the genes are responsible for a lot of what is taking place here. And we're going to end up, ultimately, with a cortex where you can actually see different types of neurons at different layers. And if you look at this section through the cortex, it just basically has been split. So they've basically taken a razor blade and just cut through the cortex and put it under a microscope. That's the outer surface. And this is the inner um, part of the cortex that you can't see. But you can, I think you can, looking at these, you can probably tell that there's kind of like a layer here and a, a layer there, and then there's a different layer here. The actual shapes of the neurons are such that you get this impression that the cortex is layered, and it is layered, five or six different layers in the cortex.
So, um, just a little summary. Um, prior to birth, we are generating millions of neurons. Um, almost your whole life's course of neurons, almost your whole life's supply of neurons is generated in the first three months after conception. But not all of them, because we do actually keep on producing neurons. Um, and I often wonder whether, in fact, this massive rate of producing neurons has something, and I have no science to back this up at all, but I do wonder if this might be something to do with this horrendous morning sickness that's experienced, because it seems to me that would be, that feat alone should maybe justify, I don't know, it's incredible that something like, um, uh, let's get this right, I think it's 81 billion neurons are produced in that first three months um, following conception. But you're also seeing after birth um, an increase in weight and a further increase in synaptic density after birth. Of course, the connections are now forming. That's very important. But development doesn't stop after birth. You are looking at massive proliferations, peaks in the amount of um, synapses. Now, we're not talking about neurons now, we're talking about connections between the neurons occurring at different times. So in the visual cortex, quite early on after birth, um, after one or two years, there is a, a peak in the number of connections that are being made, and then there's a dying back, there's a pruning of synaptic connections. But actually, in other regions of the brain, the proliferation carries on until puberty, and the synaptic pruning carries, carries on until around about 18 or 19 in the parietal cortices and in the frontal cortices. Now those cortices are very important for a lot of reasoning and um, a lot of behaviors rely on those parts of the brain. And yet what I'm saying is that they are not actually anatomically, physically developed fully until around about the age of 19. So um, there is no doubt that development is continuing you know, during the adolescent years, and that's something that we're beginning to understand. It may be that these people <laughs> look like they're adults. Um, maybe sometimes we treat them as big children. Maybe sometimes we treat them as little adults. I don't know. They're, just, they're bigger than adults quite often, but their brains are certainly not as fully developed. And We'll talk in a minute about whether that actually is a good idea, you know, thinking about teenagers as big children or small adults. But what sort of interaction is responsible? That's what I really want to ask you now, though, for these cortical laminate structures. How do the neurons know where to go? And it is act it's, it's really fascinating because what we see um, is evidence, for example, in this experiment that was done by Molnar and Blakemore in 91, where they placed a piece of visual thalamus um, <laughs> next to different types, other different types of brain tissue. Okay, so this is tissue that's it's, it's alive in the sense that it's still um, proliferating, but actually, you know, obviously it's not part of an operating brain anymore. It's just sat there in a Petri dish. And what you see is that if you um, put the thalamus next to the visual cortex tissue, we're just talking about little bits of tissue here, well, of course, the thalamus knows it's got to connect with the visual cortex, because the thalamus is the sensory gateway. And magically, the thalamus afferents, the axons coming from the thalamus neurons, do that automatically. Now, this can't be relying on any experience, can it? Because this brain is essentially dead. It's not getting any experience these days. It's sitting in a Petri dish, or two little bits of tissue from it are. And yet there is an automatic process that takes those afferents from the thalamus into the visual cortex and stops at just the right layer, just the right cortical layer. It knows it's got to go to layer four, layer four, and it stops there. If, oh, sorry, if you put it next to hippocampal tissue, well, actually, um, you know, it's not supposed to have anything to do with um, hippocampus. So therefore, it's just growing. It just grew unconstrained. It was never supposed to see the hippocampus. It's not designed to do that. And if you put it next to the cerebellum, it just turns away. So clearly, it only knows how to find its way when it's actually next to the part of the cortex that it's supposed to be connecting to, and it then, then automatically finds its way there. So there's this sense of genetic pre-programming of the brain, isn't there? And you get that very strongly from the, these types of experiment. Now, 
but we have to we have to look at that very cautiously um, because there's lots of evidence to show that there are certainly are environmental issues that can change the way in which the brain organizes itself and before we go any further i want to be very careful about what i'm talking about in terms of environment uh, be aware that there are lots of different ways in which the environment and the brain can interact together so we can talk about genetic environmental interaction at the molecular level so for example if you reduce the oxygen that's going into your body then that will influence your brain function quite severely because it can't get those molecules of oxygen but you can also talk about cellular interactions um, and in fact you know when i was saying proteins from the notochord were causing the neural plate to change its shape well, that is a, is a cellular um, interaction to a large extent. Um, and also, of course, we've been looking at what happens when two bits of brain tissue are in the, in the Petri dish. They're interacting with each other's cells. What, one environment is changing the, the cell behavior in, in another. And yet, more often, we're talking about, and you, know, you and I tend to think generally about the environment as being um, the way in which the external environment is influencing, influencing us. And that can happen in a species typical way. In other words, if you stop yourself, or if you stop a, a I mean, the classic experiment was done with a kitten where they actually stop the kittens, uh, they, they stop the kitten from being able to see very early on after it had been born. And then they noticed that the visual cortex had not developed in the appropriate way. So the brain is born expecting a certain type of stimulus, and if the stimulus is not there, there's going to be a problem in development. So there's what you call species typical environment. But then there's also the individual specific environment that we respond to. In other words, and language is an example of this, whereby you, we could all have the capacity to develop language, or mo most of us do, but it depends on the particular environment that we experience, what type of language we acquire. Um, it's not like we come out of our mother's womb expecting to hear English or expecting to hear Chinese. It doesn't work like that. So these are all different types of environmental uh, genetic interaction. And actually, we've got different names for them. And the real reason why I'm emphasizing this so much is that there's a huge warning to you if you use the word innate from now on. Okay. Because I've explained this to you, you've probably noticed that there's only one of these that are actually labeled as innate. So, you know, I'm, I'm making this documentary at the moment and the people, the producers are always saying, oh, yeah, can you just say um, that your, you know, your ability to, to speak a language is innate? I'm saying, no, <laughs> I really have a problem with the word innate. OK, because. Generally speaking, we only tend to talk about innate as, as these cellular interactions between genes and the environment. These sorts of things whereby you learn to see, you learn to process visually, we don't call that innate. We might call them primal, but actually they rely on stimulus from the environment for them to occur. So they're not innate. It's not like you're, you're born with the ability to see irrespective of anything that happens in the environment. If you don't get the right environmental stimulus, you won't see properly. So therefore, this word innate, you write that in your essay, you need to have a little alarm bell that goes Okay, I'm going to be looking at it very, very carefully. It's like the word cause. Okay, that's another word, cause. You start writing cause. I hope you'll hear that sound now when you write those words. So we have to be very careful how we talk. And what I find really interesting is that actually down here, we've got this wonderful word learning. We are also, as educators, really interested in the genetic environmental interaction. It's called learning. OK, that's that's the genetic environmental interaction that we're interested in, where we've got somebody sat there with all their biology, all of their genes, but also their recent their their history. And they're interacting with a particular uh, present environment. So their past environment, their present environment, and their genes. That's a gene environment interaction. And as educators, that's the one that we're most interested in. Where would you classify Hello. Where are you? Hello. <laughs> Where would you classify what we call instinct? Ooh. 
instinct. Well, the thing is, I suppose an instinct is an unconscious processing of information such that it influences your decision making, even though you're unable to explain it or possibly even to be aware of it. And we had an example of that. Have we had that? I think we have. Um, when in the Iowa gambling task with Damasio's somatic marker. So he could see people's instincts at work because he could see their bodily reaction even though they were consciously unaware of it. And you can call that instinct if you like. Implicit, implicit learning. So it could be caused by this. It could be caused by that. It could be caused by that. It could be caused by all of those things actually. But the important thing about instinct, I guess, if you're going to define it scientifically, is that you are consciously not aware either of it, of the, of the influence, or of it, or of um, how you attained it. It, it. Probably the definition changes. So, what sort of interaction is responsible, for example, for our aerial structure? Because if if you think back, these are all Brobman's areas, and Brobman's areas are defined by the fact that they have different cellular structures. So, how did that come about? Do we go for a, a genetic explanation? It's all pre-programmed. I've just talked about the issue with the Petri dish. Um, well, the two theories are sometimes described as proto-map, early differentiation into cortical regions according to intrinsic factors, no activity required, no environmental influence, or proto-cortex, later differentiation depending on external factors. For example, input from the thalamus, the thalamus providing all the sensory information, since it is a gateway for the senses. Um, well, and we find there's evidence for both of them, you know, because, uh, you know, the protomap, for example, if you use knockout ro rodents that don't have any thalamic connections, so there's no input going in from the outside world at all. I know you're going to say, what about smell? That's a good point, actually. Okay, let's just leave out that detail. Then, then, you know, maybe you should see no, um, if it was reliant on external influence, then you would see no differentiation into cortical structure, but you still do. So that tends to suggest that actually it happens without the external environment impacting. But actually there's also evidence for this. So for example, input from the thalamus to other areas of the cortex um, appear to be an issue we see spontaneous prenatal activity in the brain that appears important for differentiation. So there are certain ways in which you can predict the type of aerial structure that are going to take place um, due to the internal environment that the baby is experiencing. We also see later plasticity and a lack of neat regionalization, functionalized differentiation in terms of, of area. Because if you're blinded, your visual cortex starts getting used for other things. Well, that means it must be dependent to some extent on external environment. Um, and we know that no and gene expressions can still give rise to graded maps. So, you know, we're, we're saying there's probably a halfway house here. It's, it's, not, it's not nature or nurture, it's both of those things working together. And that, that is the, going to be the answer, you know, many, many times, if not always. That it's always an interaction between the genes and the environment that are actually causing these outcomes. Um, so, yeah, so reducing a thalamic input to a cortical region reduces its size. That's more evidence for the fact that thalamic input is really important during development. Uh, rewiring of thalamic inputs causes the new target region to take on properties of the normal target tissue. So in fact, you can take the thalamus connection, put it into another part of the brain, and that part of the brain starts rewiring itself as if it was, if it was the old one. So by simply by changing the thalamic connections, you can actually design how a cortex differentiates itself into different areas. So it must be reliant on the thalamus. The thalamus, of course, is external environmental influence because that's where all the sensory information is coming through. So, neural activity, um, other, I should say, that should be, sorry, that should be other neural activity. 
caused by the external environment, it does appear to be a critical factor in aerial development. It's not just innate. The answer is protocortex and protomap. And that's going to be you know, the answer to many such questions. Is it nature or nurture? It's both. It's always going to be both. Even at this very early stage in development of the brain, it's both already. OK, so. Um, and, and we're really just underlining this very, very important uh, relationship. The phenotype, who you are now, is caused by an interaction of your genes and your environmental history. Um, but there is also this thing called epigenetics. And this is an area of in increased interest uh, at the moment. Um, I'm going to move that. I think I'm going to move that on a little bit because I don't want to get behind. But um, the simple genetic dogma is that DNA gives way to RNA, which gives way to protein. And that produces the structures such as brain structures. Um, in actual fact, you know, this idea we have now is that there is something called epigenetics, which can be heritable, but is not actually being caused by DNA changes. So there is another route by, whereby the environment can produce um, heritable changes other than evolution. Okay, so because this is not being transmitted uh, through the DNA, and yet it is being transmitted across generations, and that's quite interesting. Now, you will come across a hard and a soft form of epigenetics. So be aware that people use this term in different ways. Um, I mean, generally speaking, sorry, okay, so this is the more sort of, I'm talking about it in the more hardcore way, whereby it's actually being transmitted across generations. But sometimes people use epigenetics just to say, oh, the environment is changing the way in which DNA is expressing itself. But, but I'm adding on the additional constraint that, and it can be inherited over generations. That's the stronger form of epigenetics, if you like. And one example of this is where um, methyl groups attach to DNA and make them less transcriptionally active. And then though that, 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 uh, that attachment of methyl groups to DNA actually becomes inherited. So the next generation will find more methyl groups attached to those particular parts of their DNA. And it's interesting because it, it means that you can actually respond to your environment over one to three generations. So this is like super fast evolution, if you like, except it's not because it's not in the DNA. Um, and that could be a really good thing because it means you can tune up and respond very quickly. So if the environment changes, um, you're, you know, and you can change and your children can change, even though they haven't experienced much of the environment yet. It could be wonderful. But the bad point to it is that you can produce negative looping patterns. So, for example, if, um, if rodents... Um, don't receive enough licking and grooming. They can become really stressed out. And that is, a, it is seen in, in the altered pattern of methylation. This is an epigenetic change. And they're producing heightened stress res response in the normal environment. And that's not really very healthy. And then the next generation can actually be showing exactly the same behavior, even though they haven't been in contact with that environment. And so that, that stress response can actually get transmitted over generations. So this is all very cutting edge stuff and it's still not fully understood. But I just wanted to, I think what I'm trying to do really is to break down this very rigid dogmatic view of genetics. And you will hear some of my colleagues, and I've got great respect for Robert Plowman, he's doing some fantastic work in genetics and education at the moment. But you often hear molecular geneticists use these types of phrase uh, such as you know, that, that um, genetics has a unique causal status in developmental outcomes due to unidirectional influence. But actually that unidirectional influence, the idea that the environment um, is, is not so important, the idea that you know, genetics all on its own is influencing outcomes without any, um, it, it's kind of 
for me, it's flawed because of what we're beginning to understand about epigenetics. And we're beginning to get a more sophisticated understanding of the way in which genes and environments um, interact. Nevertheless, you know, there, there is some fantastic uh, evidence for the importance of genes, and there's, there's no way that we should be ignoring that. Um, it's giving us um, insight, for example, into the general nature of a lot of cognitive issues. So we find generalist genes that are, appear to be heritable. We don't know which ones they are, <laughs> but we know they exist because they're heritable. Um, but we're, we're having difficulty finding them anyway. Um, and they appear to explain performance in maths, and they also explain performance in English, and they also explain performance in a whole range of different subjects. And this is important because if we can identify those genes, then maybe we can uh, you know, match education to a particular genetic profile. However, the real issue here, which we're becoming more and more aware of, is that we're not talking about one or two candidate genes. We're actually talking about many candidate genes that are actually interacting with each other. And in fact, it's the same genes that are in different combinations that are predicting problems with reading as might predict high ability in reading. And therefore, there is not a, a solution probably available of the eugenic nature, which is probably a good thing because eugenics is a nightmare um, and we don't want to see anybody going down that road. But we are in danger of it because we are getting to the point whereby we can alter, um, you know, we can move towards this designer baby sort of approach to life. But I don't think personally that we're going to be able to do it very well when it comes to educational performance because we have so many of these genes and they're interacting in different ways. So if you take out one or two genes um, and then you see those genes missing from the population, one or two generations down, you could still see the same problems arising that you've tried to erase because the genes, you know, you can't eradicate them. And they're going to come together in different combinations. Um, it doesn't really make sense. It's not the case that we can get rid of a candidate gene for dyslexia. Okay, all we can say is that these combination of genes appear to be bad news for reading, but you can't get rid of them because they are actually contributing to general reading ability. So we hopefully may be protected from eugenic um, approaches. But nevertheless, we are, what we're understanding from genetics could be really important in terms of understanding individual differences. Um, so I prefer sort of uh, this sort of approach whereby um, we're actually saying that, you know, we're not looking at a maturational unfolding of pre-existing information in the genes. That's the important thing. It's very much about how it interacts in the environment. And also, we've now got epigenetic processes whereby the environment can actually cause, um, can cause um, heritable changes uh, in behavior that are biologically transmitted across um, generations. Biology is not destiny. That's the bottom line. And in fact, uh, people such as uh, John Morton, who's a very famous developmental cognitive neuroscience, one of his maxims is that remediation is always possible. Nothing is determined. And it's a very refreshing thing to hear um, cognitive neuroscientists coming out with that sort of phrase, because often um, social scientists <laughs> try to portray neuroscientists and cognitive scientists as people who believe in this very determined universe. And, and yet what we're learning is that it's not determined at all in that way. That's the message from neuroscience. Biology is not destiny. So I prefer a neuroconstructivist approach whereby we're saying that cognitive and neural outcomes emerge from a complex bi-directional interaction between inputs and such as genetic, environmental, um, sensory cortical activity from other regions. I like the way that Annette Kamilov, Kamilov Smith has put it. Evolution is argued to have selected for adaptive outcomes and a strong capacity to learn rather than prior knowledge. Within such a perspective, it is more plausible to think in terms of what we might call domain relevant mechanisms that we are born with uh, that might gradually become domain specific during our development. 
as a result of processing of different types of input. So this idea that you know, our brains during the Stone Age, we started developing a cortex that was specialised in identifying flowers, hunting and gathering and these sorts of things, is not true. Our brains, are, our cortex in particular is domain general. And we learn to specialize as a result of the inputs that we get during our lived experience. Now there's a consequence if you take, uh, several consequences if you take that approach. Um, you can think about things probabilistically. I haven't had time to go through that slide, but you might want to go back to it. Essentially it's saying that life's like a marble that starts at the top of a mountain. And you know you could just blow that marble a little bit one way or the other, and it may go down that ridge or that ridge, but the ridges that it goes down, it gets stuck in. So right early on, you know, um, very small changes can bring about massive long-term outcomes. And as you get older, I was looking at myself here, um, you get a progressive restriction of fate. Right? You know, it's, things are still possible, but it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Okay, well, that's why I'm not going samba dancing. Right. Okay, so um, in summary, you can assume this is what we have to work with, but I want you to know that it's really not that simple. This is, this is the dogma that we work with, and it's, it, this is the way that things are looked at scientifically, um, and this is what you're going to come across on the course all the time, but actually we know that things are not that simple, and more and more we're beginning to understand this very complex interaction um, and also that, that, that things such as free will, um, let alone any religious issues, but the free will, which is very important, I think we all want to believe in, not all of us do, mind you, but most of us believe in, that is left out for the picture as well. I think it's important to remember that. Um, okay, we're going to be looking at language and, you know, next time we meet we're going to be looking at language and actually it's useful to think about what this might mean in terms of language. Um, We've got Wernicke's area and Broca's area in the brain, which are very important for language. Um, and we say, oh, you know, language is mostly left lateralized. But do, does that cause, is that because it's genetically pre-programmed? No, it's not actually. It's actually got quite a lot to do with how you're positioned in the womb, depending on whether you're right-handed or left-handed. And actually, if you're left-handed, there's a one in three chance that your language will be on the other side of the brain. So experience matters, even at that basic level. Um, we talk about critical and sensitive periods of very early language, but we're talking less and less about critical ones, because critical means there's a cutoff, that it's impossible to learn and recognize those new sounds. But we know that's not true, it's just more difficult. Um, and, you know, we also have this long-running argument about whether language itself is, is innate. You know, people still talk about our, our, our innate propensity for language. I don't believe that that's actually true. Um, but anyway, these arguments will roll and roll. The important thing, I think, is, is not to believe that biology is determining an outcome. And always to remember that we have, you know, that when you see pictures of brain images and you see that one brain is functioning differently to the other, is that, a bio, is that evidence for a biological cause? No, it's not. It will have been an interaction between genes and the environment. Right, now we are getting close. Uh, oh no, we're not getting quite close. There's a few things I've got to do first. Um, I think maybe we'll have a loo break and then I'll talk about my teaching and learning issues. Okay, and we'll do the test, okay? So can we have a loo break and be back here in 10 minutes, please? Maximum, five would be better, thank you. <laughs> Were you going to ask me a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, considering the argument where his language made is intertimate, would it be a fair compromise to say that language in general may be partly in the way that uh, genetic expression works and genetic expression probably throughout the ages throughout humanity has 
really focused on those areas that are capable of processing the programming language. So in that way, language development may be heavily influenced by genetic experiment and could be argued as being higher. I don't know. I think it's I think it's a it's an arguable point whether we actually evolved in order to whether we have evolved to the spoken language. We have evolved a little bit, but probably not that much as we might think. That, that, that's that's my first. I'm writing a book about it at the moment, so um, that's my reading of the literature at the moment. That we haven't evolved nearly as much as you might think in order to produce language. Certainly haven't evolved at all in order to write it. The, the important thing about us is that we're big primates, or rather we're big-brained primates. Because we're primates, we get four times as many, many neurons for our brain expansion as other animals. So that was good news. And the other really important thing for language is that we've got high levels of oxytocin. I think. <laughs> because that encourages co-parenting, co-breeding behaviours that bring us into contact with each other, encourage social learning, and, and that is the springboard for language, I think. Mm. Uh, I might as well, if you're ready, I might as well take, take I think it's on you, is this on you? Yeah, I might as well take you down to do. Oh, of course you'll miss my, my wonderful teaching and learning though, so that's a bit sad. You'll miss my relaxation therapist. Did you, well, yeah, maybe you better hang on then, look. Maybe you better hang on. I can take you in a minute. Should we do that? Okay, if I, whatever you prefer, I can take you out. We take you out that, that way. Oh no! Oh yes. God, I thought I forgot my keys to my office. Then that'd be fairly typical. Mm, you're going to miss Samuel Barber, you're going to miss counselling, counselling each other about our worries and our anxieties. Yeah, it's been shown to raise achievement as well, you see. But I'm not.
almost all here. No. Oh, have, you, have you not signed the register? Anyone not signed the register? Yeah. Have you not signed it? No, you have. You have signed it, okay. How do we not get it? <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> oh, I this is quite difficult. <laughs> So, um, the first thing, the first thing I wanted you to do, actually, let's, let's just get that back for a minute. Uh, oh, no, oh, I don't know. I don't know, what am I doing? What am I doing? Um, okay, so the, f the first thing I wanted you to do was just, and this might seem a bit bizarre, but... I just wanted you to take some time to talk to your neighbour about your anxieties about this test. Okay, so just two minutes. you two to move, could I, down to the front. I'm just trying to spread people out because uh, I got a, had a complaint last time that people were cheating. I know, but I've got, I've got to be seen to be... Yeah. Do, do one of you could sit down there? Would that be all right? If you could sit there for the test. Yeah, thanks. Would you mind, uh, sorry to jump, would you mind if you two sat down the bottom, bottom right down there? Is that okay? Yeah, I'm just trying to thin people out because last time I had students complaining that they were being cheated. Yeah, that they were cheating. So, okay, then I'm going to ask those people to move along a bit. See. Um, well, still, I've not done very well with this, have I? So, would you, mind, would you two mind sitting? Oh no, there's no table there. That's not going to work, is it? I'm trying to spread people out, but it's quite difficult. If I make a bit more space, would it be possible for you to sit down, down on that one? Yeah, can you? How many people are sat here? Yeah, if you could sit there, that'd be great. Or just sit along there. I'm trying to do my best to position people. Yeah, I'll find it, yeah. Would it be possible for you to sit here? Is that okay? Um, is it possible for you two to sit down here and then those people can spread out a bit? Is that alright? 
and if you could if you could move along, yeah. just move along one and then spread out. Right. Um, oh, that that you're still very crowded there. Yeah, well, it's a, yeah, you're fine there. I, I, I'm going to ask this row here. Would you would you two mind moving down to the front, then we can spread out a bit more? <laughs> Last year, I, I had um, I had a complaint from one of the students. I didn't know anything, but one of the students complained. They felt that, that there'd been some cheating going on, and because it is a formal assessment, I have to make, take some measures to try to spread people out. But of course, I will also be watching you like a hawk. Okay, so seriously, actually if you could move along sir, that one more person, maybe Corolla could move down to the front there, then you guys would be a bit more spread out. I mean I know you're all completely honest people, but I have to be, you know, I have to try to make an effort to uh, do what I can. Right. So, um... Why, why, why are you doing that? I, I, a study has found, and I'm not sure this is, you know, this is very interesting actually, because there's been, shh, there's been some studies lately on maths anxiety. Maths anxiety, we're beginning to understand, is a very serious barrier for a lot of children in terms of learning maths. And once they get anxious, they're not learning, they fall behind, they get more anxious. So it's quite a, a loop of, of negativity. And uh, what they found in a study recently is that the effects of teenage maths anxiety can actually be reduced by writing about it. I didn't ask you to write about it, but I suppose on the same um, you know, process is actually expressing it to your friend. I was quite interested in this in a way. I, I don't really understand how it helps because I would think that in a way it's bringing to your attention even more the fact that you feel anxious about it, but apparently sharing it actually reduces the anxiety and allows you to objectify it and allows you to control it more. That's what the, the researchers were saying. And they, they took half the stream, half, sorry, half the class, half the big cohort, they asked to write about it. The other half they didn't. And they found that the maths anxious students in the group that wrote about it did much better. So it's an interesting strategy. Um, I'm about to try to relax you before the test. Why am I doing that? Well, it is true that mild stress can improve learning in some contexts. In other contexts, it actually reduces learning. And we're beginning to find out how that works with the help of neuroscience. So there's a fantastic review that was done by Joel Zell. It's on Blackboard. And he, or oh, it might be she, I don't know, but their team found that if you review all of the... Um, studies that have been done on stress and memory, if stress is to help learning, and we're only talking about mild stress here, but if mild stress and anxiety is to help learning, it has to occur in the same time and space inside the brain and externally. So externally, in a way, that's kind of obvious, I guess, because if the stress occurred last week, it's not going to help you now. But inside the brain, for example, um, Sometimes worrying about your learning when you're revising, that's going to involve the amygdala. The amygdala is next to the hippocampus. The hippocampus is very much to do with encoding declarative memory for facts and figures. So that's probably going to help you when you're revising if you're feeling a bit anxious, a little bit anxious about what you're doing. When it comes to the actual, uh, if there's another type of stress, like it's because you're cold in the room, that involves a different set of brain regions uh, quite away from the hippocampus and therefore although that's also a type of stress just feeling physically uncomfortable when you're revising is not going to help you revise but of course now you're actually you're supposed to have learnt and you're supposed to be recalling the information it's too late for that mild stress to help you that mild stress is just a distraction so I want to try to reduce it because we know that anxiety decreases working memory efficiency and what we're looking at here is increased activity due to people trying to compensate for that anxiety, that loss in working memory when they are trying to do a, a simple learning task. So the more anxious you get, the more you activate this region, which, by the way, is what? 
dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I said it would crop up again and again. Okay, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, very related to working memory. Um, and the more anxious you feel, the more you have to try to compensate by increasing more work on that working memory because it's being taken up by, what will I do if I do badly, blah, 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 blah. We don't want that. We want you just focusing. Okay. Um, right. So that means I need to relax you before you do the test. <laughs> so um, there's no time limit really on this. Uh, a lot of you are going to do it within 15 or 20 minutes, it often happens. Once you've done that, you just put your hand up, I come and collect it, um, and then you leave, okay? Some people take half an hour. Actually, you've got an hour, I don't mind. I'll wait till the porters kick me out, I don't really mind. So there's no time limit to it if you want to keep on um, checking your answers. Um, I say that also because I, I don't, you know, I guess you can look at it, but please don't write. Um, but there's not really any serious time limit. And of course, the other thing, the other important thing here is, as I'm giving them out, I'm going to play this very, very relaxing music. Shh, relax. Relax. Um, do you want to give one out and pass them round? Give one out and pass them round. Give one out and pass them round. You're feeling better already, aren't you? I'm going to give one out. Oh, that's no good. I've ripped it. Give one out and pass them round. Let's see how three went Oh, well. Wow. I want to give one out, pass them around, pass them back. So don't start yet, I'll give you a, a go in a minute. Just sit there and chill. Has anyone got any spares? I'm feeling relaxed already. You got some spares? Thank you very much. Is there anybody who hasn't got one? Oh, you got one now. Everyone all right? Is there anybody who hasn't got a wonderful examination sheet? Just breathe in, relax. You see the shape turn it off now, don't you? Right, get on with it then, please. <laughs> Here you go. So you can just circle a box or tick a box or cross a box. I don't really mind. But do something with a box. And don't forget your name. <laughs> You've forgotten your name. Oh no, there's not a problem with the photocopies. <laughs> Come on, please, because it is, it is an examination. I can see there's a problem on the paper. I'm just <laughs> dealing with it. Mm. Good one, that is, isn't it? I think you're all going to get a point for question three, okay? <laughs> okay.
easier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, well. <laughs> Obviously, I've made things a little bit easier on question 10 because I've reproduced an answer twice. If you think it's that answer, just tick one of them or tick two of them, I don't mind. <laughs> You can, but everyone's going to have a correct oh, for number three because I've made a mistake, obviously. Anybody who hasn't signed the register. 